the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame. The game of women's basketball has changed a lot since I wrote the 1901 Spalding Rulebook. You need to visit the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame in Knoxville, where they celebrate the past, present, and future of the women's game. So much to see and do. Cheers, Senda Baronson. Good evening uh, and welcome to the Southern Festival of Books, virtual edition, the streaming edition, the online edition, 2020, I like to call it uh, the mask-free edition. My name is Sean Kinch and this session is Greetings from New Nashville, an interview with Steve Harouche, uh, interviewed by Margaret Rinkle, and we're going to get to them very quickly. I just have a few program reminders uh, before we get started. Uh, first of all, uh, those of you who are watching online, it doesn't matter what platform you're on, whether you're on Facebook or through the Southern Festival of Books app or through uh, other platforms, you can input questions and we will receive them and uh, we'll keep the conversation going. So please send in your questions. We'll be ready for that. Um, uh, quick introductions uh, to our sponsors. Uh, the Southern Festival of Books, I promise you, will return in a physical form. It will go back to the library in the future. But in the meantime, we are so happy that it's online. Uh, and we really need to thank our sponsors, including the Metro Nashville Arts Commission, the Ingram Contact Content Group, the Tennessee Arts Commission, Vanderbilt University. And I want to say a special thank you to Parnassus Books. Parnassus Books, if you, if you are a regular shopper online at parnassusbooks.net. Um, they have done a number of virtual events uh, that have had some real success. And in fact, uh, the success of the Parnassus Books online events is one of the reasons why I was confident that this uh, virtual book festival would also be a success. I also encourage you uh, to bookmark chapter16.org. That's why I'm here. I'm a frequent contributor to chapter 16. Chapter 16 is your one-stop clearinghouse for everything literary having to do with Nashville. Um, if the book is, uh, if there is a professor giving a talk at University of Tennessee, we will review it. Uh, bookstore in Memphis, also those events here in, uh, in Nashville, we also review those. So chapter16.org and Parnassus Books. All right, we'll get right to it. Steve Harouche uh, has a new collection of essays. It's called Greetings from the New Nashville. Uh, it has contributors from all over Nashville, and it takes a look at what has happened to our, our town over the last decade and a half to two decades. It has a number of different perspectives. It's a fantastic book. Steve is a longtime Nashvillian, and he himself has a great perspective on this town. What's also interesting is that this book, it's published right now, it's published in October by Vanderbilt University Press, but it went to press before 2020 became the show it has been. Um, so it's, it'd be interesting to talk to Steve about how the town continues to change. I'm about to hand it over to Margaret Rinkle. You know Margaret. Margaret is our local contributor to the New York Times. Uh, her book last year, she was the darling of the 2019 Film Festival with Late Migrations. Um, and Steve and Margaret, welcome, and welcome to Southern Festival Books. Thanks, thanks so much, Sean. Also, um, I want to thank, I want to add my thanks to Sean's thanks to Humanities Tennessee for this um, annual event, which is for so many of us readers and writers, the, the true literary homecoming every year. We can't be together this year, but this uh, virtual space has been a great substitute and we get to see Steve's guitar and Sean's book wall. And um, you can see pictures of, you know, 
my childhood behind me. It's got some advantages. Um, I want to remind you that if you follow along in the chat um, in the Southern Festival Books app or on, in the comment section on Facebook Live, um, there will be a link to Steve's book, Greetings from New Nashville. If the to it, it, the the buying the book through Parnassus Books, our festival partner, is a way to help us keep the festival free every year, and a great bonus for um, per purchasers or greeting greeter greetings from New Nashville is that Steve will sign every copy um, sold. So help us support the festival by clicking that donate button and by buying a copy of Greetings from New Nashville through our book selling partner, Parnassus Books. Um, Steve, I was going to ask if you wouldn't mind. I, I, the thing I miss most about actual book events without people's guitars and book walls is story time. I'm, I really, really miss sitting in the bookstore or the library and just surrendering to an author reading something from their book. So would you pick a little part? It doesn't have to be something you wrote, although I think you wrote a, a really big part of this chunk of this book, but you could read from somebody else's essay if you want to, just to give us a taste. Yeah, um, I'll uh, I'll pick my essay. You know, it's funny. There's, there's so many of these that I um, thought about reading from, but I, I really felt it was better if I read my own, partly because I just wasn't sure I was going to be able to do justice to other people's work. But um, I'll read a little bit from the introduction. Um, and uh, this starts with, um, and speaking of chapter 16, you can read uh, more of this, uh, of the introduction uh, over at chapter 16. But this little section is where I make the case for why the book starts with 1998 uh, as the starting point. Um, and uh, I start with a quote from uh, Marshall Chapman. I think a lot of Nashvillians will recognize that name. Uh, she's quoted um, in W Magazine in 2011. And this is what she says. It's hard to pinpoint the exact moment the sleepy town of Nashville became a real city, but I'll go with 1998, the year the NHL Nashville Predators and NFL Houston Oilers, now the Tennessee Titans, moved here. Suddenly, everything exploded. You'd look over the city and all you'd see were construction cranes. Like all narrative starting points, 1998 is to some extent arbitrary. The Chapman reminds us that what is old is new again. The construction cranes are back, piercing the sky in every direction. Their silhouettes now emblazoned half-jokingly on everything from rock show flyers to public radio station pledge drive socks. The starting point isn't random either. 1998 is the year Owen Bradley dies. As much as any artist and producer, Bradley helped define the Nashville sound. And Music Row was more or less built around the Quonset st Hut studio he operated with his brother Harold on 16th Avenue South, where Patsy Cline, Brad Foley, Brenda Lee, Marty Robbins, Sonny James, and countless others recorded. Still, as much as the Nashville sound is now synonymous with what we might now might call classic country music, it was a conscious departure from the folksy Bristol sessions that birthed the genre. Now we've cut out the fiddle and steel guitar and added choruses to country music, Bradley once said, but it can't stop there. It always has to keep developing to keep fresh. The same year Bradley passes, the advocacy organization Walk Bike Nashville is formed. In coming years, it will be at the table for countless discussions around walkable neighborhoods, pedestrian safety, biking infrastructure, the stuff of urban renewal. The Nashville Banner, the afternoon newspaper that shared a building with the Tennessean, ceases operation in February after 122 years. Garth Brooks, Faith Hill, Tim McGraw, and Dixie Chicks, now just the Chicks, rule the country charts, but it is a banner year for Nashville's independent music scene. Lucinda Williams's Car Wheels on a Gravel Road, Dwayne Jarvis's Far From Perfect, Kevin Gordon's Cadillac Jack's Son, Paul Birch and the WPA Ball Club's Wired to Wire, and Lamb Chop's What Another Man Spills are all released this year. To whatever extent it registers in Nashville at the time, a Detroit band called The White Stripes releases its first single, Let's Shake Hands, in 1998 as well. Jack White will eventually settle in Nashville, establish Third Man Records, and in so doing, alter the perception of the city. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here and say that 
1998 is also the year that a 25 foot tall statue of Nathan Bedford Forrest, slave owner, early leader of the Ku Klux Klan and Confederate general is erected on private property in full view of I-65. It is also the year that a years long effort by the National School Board ends court supervised desegregation, the consequences of which will be deep and long lasting. Outside of Hank Williams, there is arguably no more iconic figure in country music than Johnny Cash. In 1998, fresh off a Grammy win for Best Country Album, The Man in Black appears in a full-page ad in Billboard magazine. It's an older photograph taken in 1969 at San Quentin Prison. Cash's mouth is drawn up in a grimace, his lower teeth pressed against his upper lip, the way one does when producing the F sound. He holds <laughs> up his middle finger emphatically. American Recordings and Johnny Cash would like to acknowledge the Nashville Music Establishment and Country Radio for your support, the caption reads, a reference to the absence of the album from the airwaves Cash once ruled. The sarcasm doesn't come cheap. Producer Rick Rubin reportedly shells out $20,000 for the ad. On April 15th, a little more than a month after Cash's flipping off of Music Row, a tornado touches down a mile west of where Charlotte Park Charlotte, Charlotte Pike meets I-440. I'm just going to stop there because I think a lot of us know at least the outlines of what happens after that tornado. Um, and uh, it's really, I think, in a lot of ways, the beginning of the new East Nashville, which I think in many ways ushers in the new Nashville. So that's the argument for 1998. The argument for 1998 is, I mean, I mean, you make that case incredibly persuasively. I've heard a lot of other dates um, and, and you address them in your introduction of, for possible turning points. Um, I came to Nashville in 1987. You came to Nashville in 2003-ish. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, uh, we watched it happen, however, whatever year you you pick. But I, I guess my question is, um, the, I'm interested in the origin story of the book. Like, hmm. like, how did you come up with this idea? I mean, what you've basically created is like a little history book of the Nashville we live in now. And you explain how we got here through a, a lot of different threads, following a lot of different threads. But how did it ever cross your mind to come up with this book in the first place? Um, well, that um, speaking of Parnassus books. Um, so um, I think really it starts one day. Um, and Margaret, you've witnessed this in the bookstore many times, which is there's a customer asking for a book. The first bookseller they talk to isn't quite sure if they know what they want. Um, another bookseller will walk over. It kind of kind of turns into a party of sorts. Um, and uh, you know, sometimes eventually someone comes to the back and says, you know, "Can anyone come out?" So basically, there was um, there was a man in the store who is from Chicago, um, and his daughter had just moved to Nashville, and. Um, uh, you know, I was in the back and I was the person who said, who they found when they said, can you, can somebody come help this guy? And he said, you know, I, uh, I visited Nashville maybe 25 years ago, 30 years ago. And it was just this, I mean, it was fine, but it was just this little town and um, look at it now. I mean, it's like, there's so much going on. It's so exciting. I, I want to know what happened. And um, so I, and just them looking at the shelf, like, well, um, I tried to get, I tried to sell them um, the Nashville Sound by Paul Hemphill because I said, listen, this book came out in 1970, but right. you know what? We are still arguing about the same stuff that's right. in this book, and you learn so much. It's so interesting. It's like, now, no, I don't. I, that's not really what I want. I, I want to know how the city came from 20, 30 years ago to what it is now. And I said, well, I'm sorry, that book doesn't exist. Um, and you know, like, it's always disappointing when someone wants to buy something, wants a book and you just, you don't have it for them. Right. Um, and so I just w went back to my little desk and whatever. And, but it, I, I just kind of kept coming back to that. Like, 
um, because you know these are things that you and I have talked about a lot that all of us have talked about a lot like well what did happen right um, so I just it kind of kept coming back to me like that that book doesn't exist um, and I I think I even kind of looked around like did, I did some searching like is there sort of a book that we just don't carry or that mm -hmm. went out of print or something right um, and I I the more I thought about it, the more I realized that, no, that book didn't exist and I wanted to read it. Um, and then I just started thinking of all the stuff that was out there um, that had little pieces of the story already, you know, things that had already been published where there was a little seed of the story, um, a little thread that um, that you could follow if you if you wanted to. Um, so basically, I, uh, I emailed Vanderbilt and uh, where I where I did uh, the Jim Ridley book and said, you know, and I think <laughs> I told him, I think I told Zach, you know, the other day this guy came into the bookstore looking for this book, um, and it doesn't exist. <clears throat> Would you like it to exist? Um, and so really, that's uh, that's how it got started. Was just just there, you know, the the book wasn't there, and I thought maybe it should be. Well, it's perfect for a newcomer to town to understand, you know, just a, a little primer almost in how to be a Nashvilleian to, you know, the stuff that the long timers and the Nashville natives, I mean, it's almost impossible to find a Nashville native anymore, but um, it, you know, the stuff they roll their eyes about the stuff they gripe about um, and to under, you know, to be an insider almost instantly by reading this book but it's also a, a good explanation for for us of how it all came together i think i knew parts of this story i certainly remember reading um about the night i mean i remember the 1998 tornado i remember hiding in a friend's basement um uh, hugely pregnant uh gave birth two weeks later um and getting down those basement steps was not easy but i remember that tornado but i don't think i knew the extent to which it recreated East Nashville and the extent to which East Nashville recreated Nashville because of, because of the creative class that um, poured into that neighborhood. But we'll come, we'll come back to how neighborhoods changed. But when you, when you, I, I think I can see the point of the book. I can, I can see the hole in the, the space on the bookcase where it needs to occupy, but what are you really hoping it will do? besides fill that hole? Is there an ulterior motive? Are you hoping to shape the Nashville to come in any way? Um, I, so, I mean, as I've said before, I think that um, sometimes we think of like, uh, we, we like to be sold on a book that is definitive or is the, the final word. And I, that was never my intention on this book. I think, I hope that what comes across is um, a, a real curiosity that um, I, and I don't think that we really know. I think the book, I think the essays in the book, the writers in the book have done a great job of kind of laying out sort of the shape of what happened here. But in, I think in many ways, it won't be a long time before we really know what happened. But I do, in the back of my mind when I was writing it or, or and putting it together, um, I really, I felt like there were times where we allowed ourselves to be sold on a vision of the city and a, and a vision of what improvement or progress meant that was not very inclusive. Um, and so I do, when you say ulterior motive, I do, um, I do feel like part of what I wanted the book to do was to shine a light on those moments where, um, where we could have been uh, more just, uh, just broader and more compassionate in our thinking uh, as a city. So um, yeah, I guess my ulterior motive would be to, to look at the progress, to look at what has been good, and then think, how could that be deeper and um, more, uh, more inclusive and to bring more people up, um, as, as the city, uh, itself, um, rises. 
Okay, well, I, again, I want to come back to this question of collisions. Um, you know, how improvement in one area has um, un, uh, unforeseen or ignored consequences in other areas. But um, when you were putting, I'm, I'm still sticking with the origin story for a minute. When you were putting the, when you were thinking through what you, you, you knew that there were certain pieces of writing that were already in existence that you could reprint with permission, but there were, there aren't that many relative to the number of pieces in here that fit that category of, of prior publications. You, you yourself, as the editor, you were not just, you know, collating and collecting, you were shaping. And you had to have had some idea from the beginning about what shape you wanted that to be. So how did you decide? I'm looking at, um, I made a little list of the, of the topics in this book. National sports franchises, the 1998 tornado, hot chicken, gentrification and housing policy, the tomato art festival, Casa Azafran, tech entrepreneurs, police brutality, the creative class. I mean, that's just a short list of, of the major topics in the book. How did you come up with that list? How did you decide? I mean, one thing that's not in there, for example, is very, uh, I guess it depends on how you define politics. I would not define discussing social justice issues as a, as a matter of politics, but we are the state capital and the city of Nashville is often in direct conflict with the state government. There's not that kind of stuff in this book. So how did you decide what to include and what to leave out? Um, well, I, to, to start with the, the last piece, the, that political tug between Nashville and the state legislature and that in, in many ways, I just felt that was sort of bigger um, and more complicated than we really had time to get into. And what I, what I hoped was that, that the, that the book would give you sort of um, that every piece would have kind of um, a street level entry point, right? That, that you, that you weren't thinking about um, legislation. You weren't thinking about, um, you know, closed rooms or back room deals or this kind of stuff that um, as much as possible, each essay would have sort of like a, a, a thread in it, a piece of it that just anyone could find a way into the story and, and, and not uh, worry about sort of navigating the, the politics of it. Um, Cause I think, I think also there's so much of the history of those sort of political struggles in the state that um, I just felt like it, it, it would be in danger of getting bogged down. So to answer your, your larger question, a lot of it was um, I would just ask, I asked Ron Wynn, would you write an essay that included these elements? Could, would you talk to Jeff Carr? Um, because I thought that Jeff is such an interesting character I mean, I don't know him personally, but as someone who lives here and has seen all the different kinds of ways he's been involved in this city, I just thought someone whose career in the arts really spans the whole span of the book. And so I talked to Ron, I said, could you, could you talk to Jeff? Could you ask him about these things? Could you ask him about how he became the spokesman for opposing the transit plan? which a lot of people were very surprised by. Can you, can you get into that, right? Yeah. Right. So, um, so a lot of it was talking, finding the writers that I, that I admire and that I wanted to include um, and just having this conversation with them and saying, you know, I, I had like, there were many spreadsheets involved, I will say. And um, so uh, a lot of that was um, those topics, right? And so if I talked to Ron and, and Ron said, yes, I'll talk about Jeff. I'll talk about the transit plan. Um, I'll talk about sort of uh, how, you know, Jeff's advocacy for um, Black Nashville and, 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 and the arts sort of interweave. And, and then I, so I say, okay, that's good. And that also connects us to, um, you know, the Edgerton book. Um, 
So, so a lot of it was talking to people and saying, you know, what, how many of these, you know, like if it's like a poster with the little pull tabs at the bottom, like how many, how many tabs are you willing to pull off yeah. um, to, to put into your essay? Right. Um, and so as people started to, to say, yes, I'll, I'll write about these things. And then I could say, those are covered. Um, and then really just trying to make sure that all those things are distributed among the writers. And what was fun is, is that there were also the little coincidences where things overlap that I didn't plan. And so that was fun too. Well, I was going to ask you about, actually, I was going to ask you about that. The, 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 the way, I mean, I don't want to get too insidery on this, but putting together a collection of essays, it turns out is hard. You know, you, you can't just like, stack, it, it's not, even though they all stand alone and even though somebody can come off the street and not know a whole lot of backstory and understand any individual piece, the way you've put them together, it's almost like a braid that one strand kind of weaves through is a major strand and then it kind of goes behind and then it comes back around front. Um, uh, throughout this book, it's really kind of miraculous. I hats off how, how you did that. I don't know, especially because you didn't write all of them. So you were holding other people's words in your mind and still putting that stuff together. But there's a lot of um, through lines because of that. I think about like, what a weird through line is T-Bone Burnett, right? But he shows up in the piece on Studio A. Um, he shows up in uh, that Ben Folds wrote. He shows up in the one Ashley Spurgeon writes about the Rise of Americana music and and the TV show Nashville. He shows up in my piece about Fort Neckley. I mean, those things. couldn't imagine three more diverse kind of subjects for for this guy to one guy to just randomly show up. And I mean, there are three lines all through the book like that. Um, was that just serendipity? A lot of it was, yeah. Um... T-Bone Burnett is a good example of that, where um, it uh, it really wasn't until, I think I actually had to take out a couple of references to T-Bone Burnett because- Well, too much T-Bone? <laughs> because, uh, you know, I thought, we, we don't actually interview him at all, but he's in here how many times? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I just, I'm one, as a reader, I'm someone who just loves when there's just some small little thing that comes up again, um, some motif, right? And, and not to reduce T-Bone Burnett to a motif because obviously he's had a tremendous career, but, um, but I think that was so much fun. Um, and when you talk about the braid, that's really what I was trying to do. And that's why the, that's why the book isn't chronological. Um, you know, the, as the introduction says that the book starts in 1998 and then the first essay is from, I think, 2007. Right. So the, I, I was hoping to at least with that first, the introduction and then Anne's essay um, to prepare the reader for we're not doing this in order. And it's we're going to switch back and forth um, perspective and time. Um, and hopefully because to me as a reader, that um, that can can be a very rich experience um, when the uh, when the chronology keeps changing and you know, each piece is inviting you to sort of reset and look in a different direction from a different vantage point in time also. Um, so yeah, that was, I mean, that was really something that was the, the fun to me, the fun of the structure uh, was to uh, move the pieces around and say, well, what happens if we put, um, what happens if Tiana's poem where she's walking downtown and someone uh, yells an epithet at her or at her husband, what if that immediately coming out of that, we have Stephen Hale's bachelorette piece um, talking about uh, those parties and the people who throw them. Um, it's a very different vibration than if they were in different places, right? And, yeah. and so just sort of moving those, um, I've always, you know, you and I both have spent a lot of time uh, writing and reading poetry. And that to me in a, a collection of poetry with like when that last line hits and then you move to the next poem that sort of energy between those two things um is is so important and like you know i'm sure other uh 
anthology editors think about it also with their essays, but it, it was really important to me, like, how does this one close and how does the next one open? That sort of getting that rhythm. Um, and the, the more I thought about making those rhythms interesting, the more all those little, like the, the braids would cross, you know, sort of um, in, in ways right. that you wouldn't, wouldn't expect. Well, you mentioned Anne's essay, Anne Patchett's essay um, about country music and how she doesn't listen to it. And she doesn't know anybody who, um, who actually owns Carrie Underwood's album that had sold at that point, six or 7 million copies. Yeah. And the very first she so hers is the very first piece after your your introduction. And it ends with an author's note. And all through the piece, there are often these little author's notes or editor's notes from you where the where there's a chance to revisit the 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 um, what the essay is about and update it in a way. Um, and sometimes just to rethink it. I mean, Anne apologizes for, you know, snarking at Carrie Underwood <laughs> um, for uh, among other things. I mean, I think that that extra layer, so you're putting the pieces in order and then even within the pieces, there's a, there's a dialogue going on between the past and the present and the near past, but still the past. I thought that was so, I mean, just adds a kind of depth and, and richness to the collection that I wasn't honestly expecting. You know, it was, it, it was, it did become more, there's nothing about this book that is overtly poetic, but it work. It is. It does work that way as a as a poetry collection might work. Um, in addition to the intersections, though, there are also uh, collisions and conflicts, and they they also weave through. So there, um, I love the the description of in Ashley's piece of Americana as um, country music for liberals. I love the the way the the question of development of of the tall and skinnies or of the um, the gentrification of areas that had previously been um, you know multi generational homes for low income families and and how all of that is colliding with tourism and how hot chicken, this wonderful um, origin story that we get from uh, the legend that we get from princes and how it is in collision with, you know, Hattie B's, you know, which is basically hot chicken by white people for white people. Um, how did you, um, how did you think through those, um, those tension points? Um, because that's, really the crux of the new Nashville, I think, is, is how all of this creates these, these tension points for yeah. us as, future, as citizens. Yeah, I think that, um, I think, well, a lot of it is just, um, you know, as I said, there, there, I felt like there were already these, um, uh, pieces already out there that were 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 asking these questions sort of not just like Zach's piece uh, that originally ran in Eater about hot chicken. It's about hot chicken, but it's also okay. about, you know, um, it's about what hot chicken means, what, what it means to to serve it, um, the history of it. Um, <clears throat> and I thought that piece was a great example of uh, you know, like I said before, it has that sort of street level entry point, right? Like there's this food that you either love, if you don't already love it, you've heard of it and are interested in it, right? And then it opens up into into these other issues, right? Um, and so I think every every piece uh, of the of the book had I, I wanted that potential to be there. So just going back through, uh, archives uh, at the scene in the Tennessee and, and looking at things. And I remember um, reading back over Bobby Allen's story. It had been a while since I, since I read it, his story about all the teardowns and the tall and skinnies and the, you know, the turnover of neighborhoods. Um, and I was really struck by um, how, you know, even though there's some, some of the reference points in it were a little bit dated, um, it still really resonated because it wasn't only about the houses, 
the story wasn't just about the houses. It wasn't just about the development. It was also about sort of patterns of where people had been able to live, been able to make a home for themselves. Um, and now the patterns of what was suddenly very desirable real estate, right? So I, th I think just the more that I just sat down and thought, okay, if I'm going to put together a collection that tries to answer the question of what happened, um, you know, the sort of unmovable object and the irresistible force would just, they just kept presenting themselves, you know, as I, as I looked both at these archive pieces. And then, you know, when I, when I would have these conversations with the writers about, you know, can your essay include this? Oh, but, you know, Ashley is, uh, Ashley's piece of, you know, when she talks about, oh, brother, we're out there. Like I hadn't even thought, I was like, when's the last time I thought about, oh, brother, we're out there. But she was so right about yeah. that sort of arriving at the exact right moment, that movie. Um, and the way that it sort of presented this South in, I don't know, just a, just a very interesting way that um, it, a, coupled with a, sort of the angelic music, uh, you know, that, it was just kind of kind of the perfect package for the time, and um, that as an opening point, you know, I hadn't really thought of it as was well, just says something like put some dusky filters on red state America, and you've got Americana, right? And um, so the, this whole idea that's that if you repackage certain things about the South, they could be appealing now in a way that they couldn't before, or they had been made appealing, right? And that that sort of opens up also, I think, you know, the the collision between uh, fashion wanting something that feels authentic and old, but also new. And so the moment was right for the South to fill that role. In some ways, um, uh, this is a little bit of a sidetrack, but you mentioned Ashley and you mentioned Bobby Allen. And, and it, it, it struck me reading this book, how many of these pieces either began life as scene, Nashville scene cover stories or were written by people who had who had those beats as frequent contributors to this to the scene or to or, or, or as staff writers at the scene so i thought maybe um you know this would be a good opportunity for you to talk a little bit as you do in in, in the acknowledgments to the book of the ways a a strong alt weekly newspaper um what role that that institution plays in a city in really dramatic flux the way Nashville has been for the last 22 years. Yeah, I, I do. I talk about this just a tiny little bit in the acknowledgements, but it, it's true that there's a, I, I leaned a lot on, um, on the Nashville scene archives, but partly that's just uh, out of familiarity because I've, I worked there for seven years. Um, but it's also where I feel like I learned how to write about the city as a place. And in order to do that, um, you have to report on it, but you also have to have a point of view um, about it. Uh, and yeah. you have to you have to make the decision, does the story how does the story fit into that point of view? And I, I think the, the great thing about alt weekly writing is that it doesn't pretend not to have that point of view. I think a lot of, and I'm not speaking ill of, of anyone for doing it, but I, I think in newspaper writing, you're very much encouraged to remove that sense of perspective, right? That, um, that you, you need the veneer of objectivity above all else. And the great thing about alt weekly writing is that you are supposed to have a point of view and um, you're allowed to explore that in your story. And so to me, like the, 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 the great thing about the scene is that we were, and writers there are allowed to really follow these little threads and see where they go it, in in the weirdest way that they can be, right? The the, the sort of uh, famously weird alt weekly story is like, it's like ten thousand words about beekeeping, right? That if if you are if you can really find that 
entry point into a story, no matter how weird, and it ends up telling a story about other things that you have the green light to do that. Um, and that 10,000 so. words is a huge thing too. Right. You know, yeah. yeah. But, but also, I, yeah. I love the daily thing. newspapers don't generally have. Yes. Yes. Um, and so I, I think that, uh, you know, my sort of, uh, my upbringing in the, the scene newsroom and, uh, you know, under the mentorship of Jim Ridley, um, uh, both knew that, that idea of really building um, a story that's about the city from just the, the smallest little kernel of, uh, of, inf of information and curiosity, you know, that that is, um, I think, something that alts still do really well, the ones that are still with us. Um, right. And uh, that, uh, I mean, we need, <clears throat> we need all kinds of press. We need all kinds of media. We need, uh, we need the Tennessean to be strong. We need uh, all kinds of media, but the, this, I think the space that, that alt weeklies fill really well is that space where, you know, we're, we're gonna go on a, on a kind of a weird ride here. We're just gonna just see where this story takes us um, and sort of be given the permission to, to follow that. Um, what, going back to the question of um, collisions and conflicts, um, much of one of the through lines throughout um, Greetings from New Nashville is the way that our growing prosperity in this city is so unequally distributed and how many, when I say it's hard to meet a native Nashvillian anymore. Some of that is because so many native Nashvillians have been pushed by the cost of living out of Nashville to the surrounding areas. Um, that And that happens, that some version of that conflict happens in the Casa Azafran piece. It happens in the two teardown pieces. Um, it happens, you know, it's, it's, it, it's braided all the way through. Is there anything about that or about any of the other recurrent conflicts and collisions in the book that you see as a cautionary tale for other mid-sized cities perhaps on the verge of this kind of explosion or, or was this kind of explosion really truly unique to Nashville at a particular place in a particular time? Um, that's a great question. Um, and I, I do, like I said earlier, I don't, I don't know that we know the full picture of what happened and why. Um, I do feel like on the one hand, you know, Nashville is, is a very it's, it's a unique place just in terms of the kind of industry we have here um the kind of people who have always been here so i i don't think that uh someone wanting to sort of you know recreate the last 20 years somewhere else um could use nashville as a blueprint um, for good or bad right I, I just don't think you can quite do it because there's enough about nashville that's so different um but i do remember the uh, there was a story in the new york times um that was about these black neighborhoods and i've already forgotten which city it was because it was it sounded like north nashville but it was actually a different city so in that regard uh, we have sort of a very unique situation here but a lot of what happened here happened all over the all over the country um and i think that you know as a as cautionary tales go i don't know that they um they don't always reach the right audience you know i think a lot of, you know um in a lot of ways you know the rebecca solna book hollow city was a cautionary tale for places like nashville and you know we right. uh, we didn't uh we didn't listen to it so much because it it seemed like such a different place so um you know, I, I don't, I'm not a, I'm not a policy person. I'm not a sociologist, so I don't know the answers to these questions, but I did, I did hope that at least, you know, if, if someone read the book, it would, it would give them pause about, you know, just if, if we're going to just bulldoze the country uh, so that rich people can live somewhere with new countertops, you know, maybe we shouldn't 
you know, rush to do that immediately. Okay. I'm going <laughs> to, uh, I have a couple more questions, but I'm going to, I'm going to interrupt my um, blather to read some questions that are coming from our audience. First, there's a comment from Ellen. I'm from Nashville originally. I'm 58. And I've been asking these questions for years now. It felt like a slow motion change and then bam. Thank you for this collection, Steve. Um, and uh, uh, there's a question from Charlie. I think you're going to like fielding this question. Do you have a chapter about Nashville becoming a national destination for bachelorette parties? Oh, boy. Charlie, you are in luck. You are going to love <laughs> this book. You're... <laughs> Um, what are the, I, one of the most fun essays in the whole book? You are um, Stephen Hale's essay, uh, "Welcome to Bachelorette City." That's um, that's the one that you want to read, and um, and it does it, it it not only is it is it funny, but it, it really does talk about the industry as an industry, and really sort of talk about the the machinery of it, and sort of the the ways in which that um, that industry was deliberately courted. So. Yes, yes. <laughs> you have a treat in store. Um, there's a question here from Maria, and you may feel that you've already answered this question, but Nashville's boom looks <clears throat> similar to what's happened in other cultural economic boom towns like Austin or Seattle. What sets Nashville apart for better or for worse? Oh yeah, that's a good question. Um, I actually uh, moved here from Seattle um, and like, um, I think a month after I left Seattle, the, uh, the little corner dive pub that I used to go to with my friends, uh, was demolished along with the entire block, um, to make way for, uh, so like the, my favorite burrito place, my little, uh, hole in the wall corner pub, that entire block was, uh, knocked down for condos like a month after I left. Um, Seattle and Austin, I think, are um, so they're they're each sort of uh, weird in their own ways too. I mean, I think um, you know Seattle has much less land on it uh, to, to begin with, so like it's just it's surrounded by water on three sides, so it's it's that effect of people want to be here so it's becoming more expensive that is really exacerbated by just the limited amount of area similar to san francisco um and you know austin i think austin was able to sort of capture um more of sort of the the that wave of post silicon um so its trajectory is also a little bit off from us um I, yeah, I don't know. I think that uh, it's it's really hard to say right now, just because, uh, as I've said elsewhere, we are in danger of losing uh, our independent music venues, and if we do that, um, I don't I don't even know what Nashville looks like on the other side of that. So um, it's it's really hard to to compare us to anyone at the moment when all of us are sort of locked in this uh, holding pattern where we're we're just trying to survive. Sean has a question. Yeah, Steve, uh, Margaret was talking about through lines, and I don't want to be a downer, but it, one of the through lines is talking about race in Nashville. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, cutting of North Nashville neighborhoods in two by the building of 440 might be one of our original sins. Uh, the book also talks about the problems of desegregation, which also has been kind of turned into resegregation. You talked about gentrification and uh, the lack of affordable housing in neighborhoods. And you also have a piece about uh, police brutality in Nashville. I'm just curious, how how serious do you think Nashville's race problem is? Uh, are we making strides? I, it, it strikes me that every one city's, every city's race problem is unique to that city. Every, we all have a different makeup. Uh, I'm just curious where you think our, our current status is on our race problem and are we making strides to make it better? Um, well, uh, I know how, how much time you got, Sean. <laughs> um, so I, I, um, I mean, 
to back up a little bit, you know, when I was putting the book together, I definitely wanted to not shy away from these things. I didn't want it to be um, a book about uh, the TV show and um, right. $15 cocktails, um, although we talk about those things. Um, so, I mean, I do think every city's problems are unique, but uh, I think a lot of the problem with this country is that we as a country have not um, really ever really truly uh, reckoned with um, the legacy of slavery, period. Like that's the, I think the right. big overarching thing. Um, and as a city, are things getting better? I mean, as, as we talked about in our chapter 16 interview, I mean, you see how the protesters were treated on the plaza. Right. Um, the black led protesters were, led, uh, were treated on the plaza as, a, as opposed to the crowds downtown who are in defiance of the mask mandate. So um, I would say in a lot of ways, we are stuck where the rest of the country is stuck. Um, that we, uh, I think the conversation has been brought to the forefront um, unavoidably. Um, and I think if there is a, you know, a silver lining to the last few years that it's that we have not been able to avoid this conversation, right? Um, are, are things moving in the right direction? Uh, you know, you mentioned Ted Elkhorn's piece on the Community Oversight Board of the Police. As you know, that board has not really ever been able to exercise its full authority that the voters granted it. So I'm going to say no, that we are, we are not uh, making what I would call satisfactory progress. Um, although I, I do think that uh, that a lot of us have been forced to to look at the problem in a way that we didn't before. And that is at least something. We have a question from Ellen, who's uh, who's in the middle of reading your book. And she says, uh, is the emergence of the large Kurdish community in the early 2000s something that turns up in the book? Yeah, um, it does come up. Um, I This is one of those uh, where I, I probably shouldn't talk too much about how the sausage is made, but um, <laughs> I did uh, I, I did approach several people about writing about the Kurdish uh, community here in Nashville in more depth um, and that it just didn't work out for a variety of reasons of, of timing and commitment and all that kind of stuff. Um, so uh, I, I do think that's uh, it's, it's an important uh, piece of the Nashville story um, and it does uh, it does get some time in, in the essay. Um, Carrie Ferguson Weir has a really nice essay about um, Nolensville Road and the, the neighborhoods there. It's a very, it's a very um, nuanced piece, I think. Um, and it does talk about uh, that, uh, that influx of Kurds to Nashville, but um, not in as much depth as maybe uh, I had hoped, but uh, it is there. We're kind of running low, low on time, uh, Steve. So I want to ask a couple of quick questions. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't want to put you on the spot. And if you don't want to answer, you don't have to <laughs> go to the next one. But you wrote really a truly brilliant introduction to this book. And you also wrote two of the essays in it. And um, this is your second book as an editor. But you're a writer, Steve. What? When are we going to see a book that says by Steve Harush and not edited by Steve Harush? And what might that book look like? Um, well, um, I am, uh, working on, um, a proposal for, uh, a book that is by me and not edited by me. And, uh, that, uh, would be, um, that would be a memoir in essays that is, uh, about my experience growing up as a Korean adoptee raised in a white family, um, but also about other things like astronomy and genetics um, and sci-fi maybe. Um, <laughs> and but, you might, uh, yeah. Can you give us, uh, guide us to a little taste of what that book might look like? Uh, well, yes, Margaret, I could. Um, if you, <laughs> if, <laughs> um, I do, I, I, love, uh, I love the rolling curveballs headed over home plate right here. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I wrote an essay for Catapult uh, a few weeks ago um, it, it's about why I don't celebrate my birthday anymore. Um, and, uh, that's probably it's because beautiful. I yeah, don't know what that is. It's a heart stabbingly beautiful. 
Thank you. Um, so uh, go look it up. It's Dave Barouche, uh, Catapult. <laughs> um, and also, could you talk to us a little bit? This is uh, Greetings from New Nashville is a, is a Vanderbilt University Press book. And Vanderbilt is, um, of course, the home of uh, Mike Ta Michael Ray Taylor's new book, a uh, uh, new memoir about caving in the Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia limestone wonderland here. Um, and it's also, um, anyway, tell us about the, the, the press's plan for the, the new series of books about Nashville. Yes, um, and actually uh, Betsy Phillips, who uh, contributes the, the final essay and greetings from New Nashville, uh, also works for the press and she is in charge of uh, a series that's going to look at uh, the history of Nashville um, kind of through the lens of things that you thought you knew, but here's the actual story. Um, that's kind of the premise for the series uh, that's going to be rolling out over the next uh, few years. Um, and I do want to put in, and speaking of the press, I do, I do want to put a, a little plug in for um, a book that I had the opportunity to, uh, to read in manuscript form. It's called I'll Take You There. Uh, it's edited by uh, Amy Thurber and Lerotha Williams. And it's, um, they, uh, it's kind of inspired by Howard Zinn. It's a, it's a guide to places in Nashville and their, uh, their social justice history. Um, and I learned a lot. Um, uh, I learned a lot about uh, civil rights history and place in Nashville that I didn't. I didn't know that this is the building where this meeting took place. Or um, it's it's really it's really cool. Um, and it's very um, it's very accessible. And it's one of those things where I, I just I can't wait for it to come out so I can just sort of I might just keep it in my glove box just to visit these places and, and be reminded of that. That history. is that soon? Is that being released soon? Um, that is in the, I think in the, in the early part of next year. Okay. Sounds great. I think we can do just one more. If you can answer it in one minute or less, what, this is from a question from Catherine. What is the next phase of the new Nashville? Put, uh, on, wish your, I knew. put on your mind reading cap. Yeah. Um, oh, I've, uh, sorry. I had, I have this little miniature baseball helmet that I, but <laughs> <laughs> it's usually over here. I, I should have put it on. Um, that's a great question. And, um, as I said before, we are in such an unusual time, like a once in a century kind of time that it's really hard to say, um, you know, the, the projections for the numbers of independent businesses, not just music venues, but independent businesses that, uh, that are at risk of going out of business forever. Um, it, it, as this pandemic wears on and uh, there seems to be very little in the way of support uh, for folks. Um, that is a, is a question I just don't even know how to begin to answer right now when, um, you know, we live in Music City and we can't, we can't go see music right now. Um, so I don't know. I don't know. I, I feel like the hopeful part of me says that we've all been humbled a little bit by what has happened, by how much is not in our control right now. Um, and that when we are able to um, sort of return to some semblance of normal, that we will have this in the back of our mind that we could lose everything, right? So how can we build this in a way that is not um, dependent on sort of just extracting as much value as quickly as possible. Like that, you know, maybe we've uh, been shown that that is not a sustainable way to live. Even though people have been saying that for a long time, maybe this pause that we've all been forced into um, is going to give us a little bit of perspective going forward um, to make the city in a way that is, you know, that is just more, um, more inclusive and more um, open and less sort of, uh, I don't know, cash grabby. <laughs> and I hope so too, Steve. Uh, thank you for your time, Margaret. Thank you for that. And all of the uh, watchers at home, uh, be sure to click on that Parnassus link. Uh, thank you to Humanities Tennessee and enjoy the rest of the Southern Festival of Books. We will see you at the next you, session. See you, Steve. See you, Margaret.
Thanks, y'all.